Okay, hello everybody, and welcome to today's roundtable called Demystifying the Risograph. This is the second roundtable of a series of four as part of the launch of our online degree show. Thanks to Cara Watson and Patrick Thomas for making these events happen. I'm here with three industry experts. We've got the lovely Anya Landor from Hatter Press. Mm -hmm. Hi, thanks for joining. Uh, we've got Charlie Abbott from Work World and Tommy Brentnell from Loose Knees and myself, Lena Yokoyama. We'll be discussing definitions around RISO, RISO and RISO as a tool to connect. This chat is open for anyone, whether you're an expert or whether you're just starting to learn about the process. Um, there will be a chance at the end to answer questions. So if anything comes up, please feel free to type your questions into the chat box and we'll refer to them in the end. So I would like to begin with a quick introduction to all the participants in this room. I'm just gonna bring up a little slide. Can everyone see this? Yeah. Okay. Um, can you see this at the end as well? Yeah, you can see. Okay. It. All right. <laughs> okay. Welcome again. I'm going to start with Anya Landolt. Um, Anya graduated from Kingston in 2018 after studying graphic design. She works at Hatter Press, which is an independent printing and publishing house based in London. Established in 2009, Hatter is thought of as an autonomous experimental space to encourage collaborators to develop ideas and facilitate both the production and distribution of new content. Anya's role at Hatter began as a rise of print technician and workshop leader and after a year, she began to work in both the press and the studio as a designer. Her practice centers around the role of the educator and how that enables graphic design outcomes built with communities. With Risa, her closeness to the machine and own style means she likes to explore the limitations of the printing technique. Trying to break down its rapid ability to duplicate, she likes to push it to create unexpected outcomes. Tommy Brentnell, also known as Piggy Bank Shoe, is an illustrator, designer, and publisher based in London. He's also a DJ and founder of the club night and publisher Loose Knees. Tommy graduated from Camberwell Illustration in 2018. His work has been shifting between traditional illustration and incorporating graphics, 3D teaching, research, and various other facets. Tommy is a multi-skilled artist. Besides his illustration and design practice, Tommy works as a risograph, sticker, and label printer. He also runs workshops teaching zine making, label, and sticker printing. His workshop practice is centered around teaching unconventional and accessible print methods, showing people how to use affordable equipment like office label printers and receipt printers to produce their own work rather than outsourcing the printing. Charlie Abbott is a senior lecturer and first year leader on the BA graphic design course at Campbell College of Arts. He is the co-founder of Workform together with Jake Hopwood and Alex Huff. Workform is a graphic design studio that works with a range of organizations from individuals, community groups, and independent businesses to cultural institutions and international brands, producing visual identities, typefaces, book design, and websites. As part of Workform, Charlie has worked on various riser related projects, including a publication called Original Risographies, which the studio commissioned and co-published in collaboration with Studio Operative. It's this one. Original Risographies explores the potential of the risograph duplicator as a tool for creating new images, as well as reproducing existing ones. 
part manual, part investigation. The book contains 56 experiments collected into chapters covering reproduction, scale, density, movement, pattern, texture, layering, and color. My name is Lena Yokoyama. I'm graduating this year from, from Campbell College of Arts. My artistic practice as an illustrator is largely informed through printmaking. I'm currently, I currently work mainly with etchings around topics of visual translation through Japanese folklore. Riza has played a big part in developing my love for printing. I'm a proud owner of a risograph myself. He's just over there. His name is Rodney. Um, my boyfriend and I started Roka Press in about two years ago in our front room with our Riza Rodney. We've used Roka as a platform mainly to collaborate with different artists um, and producing their works of art. We also frequently work with the Boa Publication House on printing artist editions and promotional material for exhibitions. Even though I haven't been able to build a sustainable practice from it in any way, I'm an enthusiast of the process and I'm very excited to learn from you guys today. Right. Thank you all again for being here. I would like to start off by asking you guys, when was the first time you learned about the process and what, what was it that got you guys excited about it? Anyone? Um, I mean, I, I think like quite a lot of people, I, I came across it probably like first or second year of uni. I think mm -hmm. especially like maybe like, yeah, like four years ago, like Rice was like, seriously seriously in vogue mm. like, it was like quite hard to um get by kind of without seeing it anywhere i think like sort of like everyone i was just immediately sold on like fantastic like neon colors and right all that. And i think yeah i mean also the fact that there was um i think you've probably seen it as well there, there used to be um yeah studio. i remember that i think sort of the fact that like, the fact that that existed as a thing that I wasn't able to use, like kind of gave it a, a thing mm. up, like mystery and excitement. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that was sort of how I first came across it. That's funny because um, me and my course mates tried to fix that same Risa in the studio as well, but unsuccessfully, unfortunately. I agree, it kind of built into that excitement of wanting to use it. Mm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I did actually manage to salvage, I've got um, four of the drums from it, but um, only two of them work. Okay. No, I did it. So no. It's been put to some use. Nice. Are you using it for a different machine now? Uh, yes, yeah, so they're in the, in the machine we've got the same. Oh, okay. RP3700. RP yeah. Over there in the corner. <laughs> Wow, that's a huge one. Is, Over by the window. <laughs> is that a two drum one? Or uh, no, it's just a one drum. Looks good though. Very nice. <laughs> what about what about you guys? Um, what when did you first access a Rizzo printer? Yeah. Is that a Tato or? Uh, Kingston have an A2 printer, which oh. kind of arrived um, in. I was on Erasmus so a couple of years ago when I came when I came into the university and there was a big project run for it with a collective called Alternative Art School. Mm. I think it really brought it in with a bang, ran a workshop in the foyer of the university um, and kind of put it to use to make posters in reaction to a conversation that was happening as part of a workshop that day, which is always mm. a really good way to use the printer. And very quickly you had very colourful, very dynamic and very um, impacting posters put up on the wall, especially at A2. It looked really fabulous at A2. Uh, and that's kind yeah, of... God, I've never used an A2 one. Mm, yeah, it's... Scale, because the colour just works really well. And then from that point, 
it was always put in the print room with the mode of printmaking, which is something I quite like because it was almost pushed as a way to make work quickly and avoid green printing as a process mm -hmm. or to develop a technique in mono printing and then be able to achieve it multiple times mm -hmm. as opposed to that's where I began my interest in using it as a function uh, more than as a style yeah so was that um, a reason for the studio or was it for the whole uni the whole uni okay wow and and could you did you have to sign up for it or was yeah it just so you'd be inducted to so sign up for a 15 minute session and you get a bit of a basic you would set up via computer there's no scan bed in the a21 um so you set it print it by a computer and then you uh put on a piece of paper the colors you want to be printing with and they try and put as many people in a half morning session together printing with the same color colors okay so that sounds like sophisticated mm, yeah <laughs> <laughs> it works well there's some good stuff coming out of it cool thank you and what about you, Charlie? Um, well, actually, interestingly enough, the very first time I think I was introduced to it was actually in probably in 2010 uh, via Hato Press in a very early incarnation. And we were students at the time and we were putting on an exhibition in a space in Camden and, and nice. uh, Hato Press. Like we're in this kind of like shared office space above um, and we'd made some really badly designed posters <laughs> and needed to get them printed and they said oh we can actually print these for you um, on what I thought was just a photocopier um, <laughs> and yeah it was quite good I mean I think I then discovered that there was the right the, the risograph is now the broken risograph uh, oh, the one that's I think in the originally worked season. it did originally work and I think I found that Illustration department at Camberwell and again when I was still a student mm -hmm. and it's the same thing I mean uh, I hadn't had an induction in screen printer so I didn't know how to do it and uh, <laughs> the risograph was really cheap and no one else seemed to be using it at the time it was um, really so, cheap then, really uh, well I think the informal way of paying for it put it that way <laughs> I see uh, <laughs> okay because um... <laughs> I don't think it was like a, you know I think it was uh, a, a tool for like testing ideas out maybe rather than you know like a printing press mm -hmm. um so yeah we used to just go and print on it and, and try things out but uh but uh again uh yeah I, I think in the same way like it at the time it was purely a functional thing um you know i was quite i wouldn't say that i was looking for an efficient way to print quite a high quantity of things quite quickly yeah i mean it's it good for that much manual labor right uh, so <laughs> that was the best way of doing it um, but uh yeah so that, that was it really okay because if you say 2010 um had to press just started a year before that didn't it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah I, and maybe i don't know when Risa got introduced to the uk properly but maybe that was just the start of it all and, I'm, I mean, I don't, I don't know really. I'm sure Andy knows better than I do about anything relating to how press. But um, I, in that time, like 2009, 2010, I certainly hadn't heard of the machine. Mm. But then I was a very naive student. I'm sure it was around doing something. Um, it, as, far, as far as I'm aware, it's been around in the UK since the 90s, and I think you can get it. Oh, really? It, it was. I think it was like sort of rolled out as um this like wonderful new solution for um, cheap duplicating in offices mm. and um, a lot of the ways I know people have got hold of them is through like um, old political party, like uh, like small town um, political party offices and stuff, like mm -hmm. um, someone who bought, bought one off like a toy party in Kent or something. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, the yeah. colours for the Riza are uh, actually be named after political parties. Mm. So they were red and <clears throat> conservative blue, I think. Um, so that yeah, it was originally a solution, as you said, 
and it's only I think only been in the last five or so years that it's been adopted as an artis artisanal creative way yeah. okay um and why do you think that it it's not as popular commercially anymore like in offices or i think they used to use it in churches as well but are there just newer updated print more efficiently and cheaper yeah possibly i think the fact you can have an inkjet printer quite cheaply and mm. print quite easily from it now i think when it first came out it was adopted by the church groups and community groups because it was a lot cheaper to print a large batch of items mm -hmm. um, whereas maybe not so much now i don't know from a point of view from a community group why they would necessarily not have a rise anymore maybe it's all the artists are buying them <laughs> maybe that's why yeah but so why do you think that artists um particular just like the risa so much what what about it is the appeal of risa what is that and is it because does it make us feel nostalgic or do we like the kind of human element of it because it's not completely automatic it's still quite manual what what about like how would you define that particular appeal of Riso as an artist i think um i've always found the physical um sorry it's used to train here um i've always found the uh physical element of it quite exciting i think that's one of the reasons I was sort of got into it, so it does it feels a lot more exciting than just using a photocopy. Um, <laughs> these other mm -hmm. out mass drums, like it's a lot. It's also it's also one of the main pulls to it for me is that it actually is, in some respects, still a much cheaper way of printing than say a proper printing, like offset litho printing. Mm -hmm. um, it's much more accessible and even cheaper than that. And like I don't know. I think, there's like, like standard CMYK printing has like a lot of limitations. You don't get the vibrancy, you don't get the spot colors, you don't get, um, no, most things you print on a photocopy of, um, if you're working in color, can often come up quite dull. So mm -hmm. in a weird way, although I think it has, uh, right, so it's to some extent, to me, it's still like a sort of a cheaper alternative than going to a proper press and getting something mm. like um, do you do you think like that too, Charlie? Or um, yeah, I mean, I think I think it sits in that like as as a as a production method, it sits in like a nice in between point where you can you can make you know a, a relatively small run of books relatively affordably mm. on it. Uh, you know if that makes it very accessible for self-publishing or artist publications where the budget isn't necessarily huge but for production quality or you know you want a certain kind of standard um yeah. but i think you know the, the kind of popularity of it is misleading sometimes because it does really well is print as we know one thing lots of times very cheaply mm. uh, but what it doesn't do so well is maybe print a 400 page yeah, exactly. um, and and so I think that you know in, in some ways that that's where the kind of slight uh, uh, you know a sort of misconception about it being a cheap or not cheap process mm. um, I mean people definitely seem to really find the aesthetic of it appealing uh, mm -hmm. and you know that kind of um, built-in lack of perfection um, and you know I also would agree with Tommy that the digital printing is often seen as being very flat um, but I would say that actually, I think in the last few years, digital four color printing has really improved a lot. And I think that we're not maybe looking at so much of a uh, divide as we were. But I think certainly at like a certain kind of budget point, it, it seems to be a really good option. Um, I would probably say that the negative aspect of risograph printing is that you can tell exactly what it is when it is. And um, yeah. to choose to print something on a risograph is to right uh in, in a way that maybe other print processes don't quite do and so i, I think that you know there's in which choosing to print your work in that process kind of brands it i suppose in a certain way mm -hmm. um and how do you 
well, how do you feel like it's different to screen printing though? Um, because a lot of people have asked me that in the past as well. They, it's basically, it's kind of the same if you lose, use translucent colors or screen prints as well. But obviously you're not working through a machine there, but aesthetically what differentiates Riso from a full color screen print, for example? Uh, I'm probably not the best person to ask. If the ink rubs off. Um, it's probably one thing that's quite different. Uh, <laughs> there's a certain like absorbency into the paper. Um, there's a, a, I would say a little bit, sometimes a little bit of flatness with Riso, mm. or, and particularly when printing, uh, you know, across like say like a bit more coverage, you don't always get a consistent um, uh, amount of ink. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, also all of the other things that people sort of like as part of the process, like the roller marks, the smudges, yeah. the things that kind of come as part of it, which, you know, you probably wouldn't expect to see in a screen print, but you That's tend true. to be a bit more tolerant of, I think. In, mm -hmm. in, but maybe someone else is a better place than me to talk about the differences, maybe. How, how would you define Riso, Anya? I would say one of the biggest things for me is the scale. There is such limitation with how big you can print up to with Riso. Uh, and even though you can do little like folding paper before it goes through the machine, um, that can get really messy really quickly. <laughs> oh, wow. I've never attempted to do that. Yeah. Uh, it sounds sketchy. can sort of work, but <laughs> it's a bit messy. Um, also, I, I'm not too experienced with screen printing, so I might not give the pro screen printing as much, but uh, knowing Rezo quite well, there's obviously quite, um, there's limitation with the way the hole is burnt into the screen and how the colours are then layering on top of one another. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there can be, especially when it comes to CMYK printing, you have to be quite careful with the colour balance and vibrancy you can get, it can get quite dark and murky. Mm. Um, again, that's kind of through the machine burning the layers onto the different masters and laying on top of one another and uh, so that's where I'd see the limit that's when I kind of want to talk printer to see if that's something that could be uh, worked on through a large-scale screen print mm -hmm. um, and yeah again uh, over a large coverage isn't always consistent um, and the print itself isn't always consistent so mm -hmm. if you want to do a large batch they all look the same. That's not always going to happen with screen uh, with Riso. So, do you do you sometimes have projects at Hato where you would want that something to be very consistent? And then, because I've noticed that some of your publications they're not all made through Riso. Mm. Um, is that one of the reasons that you choose to? Uh, not necessarily. I think if we we never try and make the Riso projects act like another type of method if that makes sense we're never disappointed mm -hmm. if something can't be the same in each one the only times that we would outsource it it really depends on the project uh, the time frame the budget mm. uh, is it an item that's going to be put in your bag a lot sometimes Rizzo can kind of transfer the ink a little bit um, just talking about we did a guidebook for a great Ormond Street Hospital and that was something we originally were going to go for the Rizzo route down but it was meant to be this um, kind of sketchbook and we were going to make thousands and thousands and we just thought that Rizzo just might not be the best technique in that instance. Right. Um, most of the time we just want to use it for Rizzo for the right reasons it's kind of the same like why make a book and not a website um, everything has it uh, reasons for being yeah mm -hmm. that makes sense um and but do you feel like hato are you trying to expand the business in like different ways away from from riso alone because it's with a riso printer i'm guessing mm -hmm. um and now since you've done a lot of cool collaborations and obviously like other publications through digital printers as well and I've seen you doing stationery and t-shirts and now workshops as well and also I think you've got a new sites business called Hato which is producing graphic design is mm. that right? um, the studio came about actually at the same time as the press 
um, a little bit before. So okay. when Ken and Jackson graduated from Central St. Martins, they you know, developed their practice as a company and the printer was one of the first things they invested in to explore their practice. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was very much around the idea of collaboration, communi uh, communities, uh, the Rezo being a facilitator to meet people. Um, Charlie's story is quite fitting that <laughs> in a shared studio space and said I wanted to print something and they said yeah we can facilitate that mm. um, I suppose that integral minds different offshoots as you will throughout, uh, throughout the process of the company existing um, sure. and also I think just depends a lot on the people who have worked in the company um, whenever be a new employee sort of starts it's very much um, a connection between everyone working to and pushing what you want to get out of your time whilst at Hatton. Mm -hmm. um, so with the press right now, we're exploring stationery, as you say, because we're thinking about more sustainable methods of creating items. But we're also pushing the CMYK process, and so it's kind of like next mm -hmm. development stage. And um, that's because our print manager, Leanne, is very much interested and very skilled <laughs> at uh, breaking the layers apart of images. Mm -hmm. uh, our newest addition has been the Hatto store, so we now have a concept mm -hmm. store in Cold Drops Yard. Progression of our community as a studio and a press, thinking about mm. uh, things that we would want to explore, represent the company, um, and a space, I guess it's like a space to do things you're interested in. Mm -hmm. um, so now we're making items to sell uh, and it's just a nice thing to do really yeah. <laughs> that's lovely so how are you involved in in the process of that all like what is your kind of area at mm -hmm. Hato? are you or are you everywhere a little bit yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> um so i started off as a workshop leader uh, and i had a little bit of experience with the rezo and it was kind of through my interest in workshops that I started to work at Hatto. I just mm -hmm. found the whole uh, exchange between educator and person learning in mm. a creative uh, setting quite interesting and through that I started to really get to know the printer more through the scan bed than through the computer but started working as a print technician to get to know the printers better. And through that, I ended up working in the studio. So as time has gone on, I might be working on a studio project, but it's very much informed by what I've learned whilst being a workshop leader, uh, because our projects wow. might, be, uh, might begin with a workshop. And it's using that, all the skills you've learned through that time. Yeah. Okay. Is that to do with the riser glitches or is that something else? Mm. So that's kind of uh, something that's developed out of being a workshop leader. I'm just going to pull these up on the screen because they're really cool. There you go. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, uh, so I've been a workshop leader for nearly two years now and being a workshop leader means I will have a group of around 12, maybe even more, if I could come to one of the drop-in workshops at LCAF, we had hundreds of participants. Um, so this is from a different project, that's a Great Ormond Street Hospital. Was but, that, were you involved in that as well? Um, were you leading that as a workshop as well? Or? Yeah, yeah, so that was for um, a, a different project, but for the Rezo glitches, I guess it came out of the idea that uh, I'd be printing for so many people in these workshops and it was always kind of, I've made this collar, I've designed it. Mm. And I started to get a little bit bored with the Rezo printer being so, um, being wanted to be so like expectant to anticipate exactly what it's going to look like. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to start to see if I could put something in the printer that I had no idea what it would come out as. Right. And that's kind of where this has come from. So this is all through the scan bed. Wow. Um, it looks so pretty. <laughs> Thank the you. Right next to the water. I can't. Yeah. What, what was it that you used there? 
that's cellophane yeah oh wow so did you did you move it while it was scanning yeah a, a mixture of things there's so many settings on the scan bed itself you can change the size of the dot that burns into the master head you can because originally it's designed for such an office mindset so if you scan in a book there's a setting that takes away the shadow of the spine of the book and it was really about just wow. kind of crushing all these different really sensible settings together <laughs> to create something that maybe wasn't so sensible um so this well, is a, a, a all sorts of still in motion there's still stuff going on well that definitely worked i'd love to see that in a publication i would buy something like that uh yeah there's hopefully in the end of the year we'll have um things to come out of this we've got an mm. uh, instagram handle if you want to follow it uh, but this will all be then coming out in the store so okay. this is the store facilitates experiments like this yeah Okay, I'll be posting the Instagram handle into the chat at the end. Or you can do that as well. And um, what are these projects? So that's another workshop that was run at Hato. Uh, so this was actually run at Great Ormond Street Hospital with a Young okay. People's Forum. Uh, and I guess I put this project in to show how Rezo can facilitate a collaboration outside of the workshop format to create an artist piece. Mm -hmm. So we were asked by Great Ormond Street Hospital to help them put together a guidebook um, for their patients who transition. So when you're 18 years old, you leave full-time care at Great Ormond Street Hospital. Um, as we know, the NHS is quite overstretched. So quite often these sh patients are sort of just left to, from left to be an adult even though they've had very supportive care up until that point mm. um, so we were commissioned to work with them to create a guidebook to sort of help them through this stage and the guidebook had to do a couple of things it had to give advice from young patients who had gone through a similar process uh, give them space mm -hmm. to maybe think about how they were feeling and um, be positive and also really vital space to write down information to be passed over to their new doctors. Um, mm -hmm. and it really had to be a book that was cherished and could be explored, uh, but also very useful. <laughs> and wow. how, we, how we developed that project was through the initial Rezo stage. We brought the printer into the hospital with the young people. And that must have been an endeavour in, in itself. <laughs> luckily we've got some on wheels so okay. that um but uh we yeah we ran the workshop and it was very much about talking about how we're feeling and creating a collaborative typeface together and that typeface then went into this book so it was quite nice is for all those patients who took part in the project when it was published they have they know that their work's in it oh that's really lovely mm. i love that and there's there's one last project um, mm. that you sent me. Um, is that to do more with the with the new um, kind of graphic design um, Hato Studio, or is that yeah. still part of the press? So this is again. Well, this is the studio, but I, and so is the Great Ormond Street Hospital project. But we everything's sort of linked and what and mm -hmm. one another. Um, so I guess I put this project in because again the Rezo was used at one point as part of the design project. Uh, this was a project with a group of students at the Institute of Education at UCL. We ran it with the Freelance Foundation and done so for the past three or four years. And um, we work with the students whilst they are learning to be artist teachers. Mm -hmm. It culminates in an end of year exhibition and publication. And one of the early stages, we were meeting together once a month to talk about, first of all, what would we even want to make an exhibition about? Mm -hmm. um, what, what are we learning? What are we taking away? And one of the ways we stimulated that conversation was by making a publication in a session. And we thought of all the different points you could put on the page. And this is the end result of publication and the mm -hmm. online exhibition due to coronavirus. Um, but 
both work really well. Oh, that um, was the online exhibition. Hmm. Wow. Like so interesting. Was it, was it that? Uh, could you walk through it? Hmm. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, and it's based on the graph, the design of the publication. So the curves of the walls are actually the curves and the letters on the front page. Yeah. Great. Oh, it's like, like the other one you sent earlier. Sorry, mm. I just go through mm. this again. Um, this one. Yeah. There you go. Wow. Oh, yeah, so the exhibition will be happening in there in the middle. Yeah. Wow. That's very creative. Yeah, so. Thank you for talking us through that. No problem. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Um, am I still sharing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Back now. Amazing. And so are you using the research for yourself as well, or are you mainly using it as part of the studio? Uh, yeah, I'd say I use it for myself with the outcomes of the research glitches. That was all self-initiated mm. and kind of born out of the stuff I was doing, part of the workshops and seeing there were mm -hmm. all settings which I wasn't really exploring during the workshops. Um, and then through that, I guess, we thought maybe they should go somewhere else and just not in my bedroom. <laughs> I understand. Very simple. Um, thank you. And Charlie, do you think you'd like to tell us about your, um, one of your projects? Maybe the original okay. Resographies one? Um, um, might be in that one himself. I'm not. I'm not in that. I just mean I'm in. The, I'm in uh, Sarah's studio. Where we made it. I'm, I'm not in. Okay, that. you were there when it was made. <laughs> That's before sure. my time. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was like, wait, is he in it? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah. Um, where Where do you want me to start? Um, do you want me to bring up that slide that you sent me? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so, what it is. <clears throat> I actually can't find the slide right now. Um, do you have, oh, found it, sorry. Yeah, there it okay, is. cool. Mm -hmm. There you go. Uh, okay, yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, it's just quite a long time ago now. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I think, I think it was 2014, maybe, um, or even earlier. But uh, yeah, so there's a book by Bruno Minari called Original Xerographies that I think lots of people know about, um, particularly anyone interested in reproduction. And I think uh, really the project. We came through some conversations that we'd had as a studio when we were still students. Um, as a student, I was very interested in uh, reproduction, I guess, both in a practical sense um, and in a slightly more, uh, you know, esoteric, uh, Walter Benjamin type sense of what it could mean. Um, and uh, I guess what, what's really lovely about Bruno Minari's work, as I'm sure lots of people know or think is that Bruno Minari seemed to always manage to tie those things together. He always managed to sort of somehow talk about the kind of the, the sublime whilst actually making actions that are very simple and very straightforward. Mm. Those two things always seem really well connected and um, graphic designers don't often come up with very original ideas. So we found this book called Original Zoographies and we were quite interested in the risograph. So we just thought we'd copy the book. Because mm -hmm. um, in some ways, the idea of a bootleg um, or a sort of sort of homage, but sort of rip off is quite nice when it comes to what the risograph can do. So mm -hmm. um, 
we just took we took the sections that uh, or we kind of took apart Bruno Minari's experiments with a, a, a photo photocopier, a Xerox photocopier, and came up with these sort of different sections, so like layering, density, um, color, and we made them into kind of areas to explore on a technical level um, with the risograph. Mm -hmm. So each section was aimed to sort of produce a sort of series of experiments that were trying to push what the risograph could do or we, what we thought it could do. Um, but also we asked uh, actually Adrian Holm, who's a lecturer from an illustration course, yeah. to yeah. produce some texts which would also talk about those different themes um, as sort of conceptual ideas, layering density, oh, these sorts of things. And, um, you know, original Xerographies as a publication was very much about experiments. And I suppose an experiment is often about uh, you, you write a series of variables, you, you, you run them, you run the test and you see what comes out. Mm -hmm. And it was really kind of important to us that we treated it in that way. So each section would contain exactly the settings that we used. Um, oh, right. So, okay. uh, uh, so in some ways, the idea was that the book could also act as a manual and you could recreate those exactly, experiments yeah. if you wanted to. Um, and I think that was quite nice. I mean, last year, with some students in graphic design, we made original original risographies too, um, which rather than getting those students to rewrite our experiments, we got them to write new ones based on the original mm -hmm. book. I think um, I remember that. And that was quite nice. Yeah, it was quite nice because it, it, it sort of showed how you could essentially make this book with loads of different people and it would always be a bit different. Um, and, you know, particularly similar to the kind of, um, the way that Anya was describing where I said glitches, as much of the work as possible was made on the screen of the, the, the risograph. So it right. wasn't something that we had to kind of pre-design. Mm -hmm. The idea was that there was more of a, a sort of sense of direct connection between the glass and the bed, mm -hmm. um, or what came out the other end. Uh, the upshot of which uh, was that it took a really, really long time to make. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and went wrong a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, I can imagine. But uh, yeah, I guess, I guess in a way, the other thing was that, and, and again, you know, graphic designers will always kind of talk in a very boring way about process. Um, but I think for us, the aesthetic of the, the machine or the aesthetic of the publication was really just a result of the process mm -hmm. rather than, I think, something that we ultimately wanted to achieve. It was... You know, the end papers were made because we were trying to run two colours through at once, you know, to wash one out. And mm -hmm. um, it wasn't really pre-planned. And I think, again, as as designers, that was something that we, we're still interested probably in, in that the aesthetic result is, is, is a result of process, not necessarily something that you've kind of predetermined. Do you feel like that was quite freeing to not have this end result in mind because if you're working digitally as a graphic designer, I'm sure there's a lot of fiddly things that you normally have to deal with. And for one, yeah. it like actually allows for quite um, random outcomes or just less. Planned. I think so. I, I mean, I think I would probably say that it's at the same time. Um, yes, I think you're right. Like I think in a way there was something where you could allow a little bit more of a tolerance, I suppose, you know, mm. a little bit less, control which is always interesting um but again at the same time i think the in our interest in the process was also trying to make it as controlled as possible uh in mm -hmm. almost fighting against what the machine wants to do naturally um you know i, I don't think you, 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 you when you kind of work with imperfect processes you don't go in deliberately trying to make an imperfection yeah it naturally comes out of it and i mm -hmm. think if you try and um, approach it in a sort of deliberately careless way, maybe results aren't so good. Um, so would you consider this trait of the riser of not being really controllable at times as a limitation or more um, as an opportunity for to create something else, something unexpected? I think I think there's a nice um, I guess I'd describe it as a personality of a machine. Right. I think each machine has its own personality as well. Mm -hmm. And each machine will do something totally unexpected to what you put in that you might not necessarily um, plan for. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, 
There's quite I a think, nice human connection to it then if you kind of give it a personality. It almost becomes yeah, I think so. You kind like of always a have friend. to... You get to know. I f- yeah, and I feel like I always feel like I have to, particularly the one that we printed this this book on, which is actually the one behind Tommy in the studio. Um, oh, it's got, <laughs> it's got so many problems with it. Um, oh, that's ha- that has gone. Oh, okay. Sorry, I thought it was the same one still. Oh, no, um, no, it, it is the same one. I'd say it's, it's got so many problems with it. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Um, you had to make sure that you warmed it up. Only ran a few prints at a time. Gave it a bit of a break. Mm-hmm. Um, which was nice but a- a- again you think that um, every process has limitations mm-hmm. and every process has opportunities and so I suppose for me the risograph is no different it just manifests in a slightly different ways and there is a slightly more human element to it perhaps mm-hmm. um, which is which is nice but also uh, can be incredibly uh, it can be yeah especially when it keeps breaking or paper jams, master mm-hmm. jams, had it all. Um, so obviously, if we're talking about limitations, I would say that accessibility as well is very often a limitation. It makes it hard for people to actually get involved with the process itself. And I know that, Tommy, you had problems at the beginning after you graduated um, with accessing a resograph. And um, yeah, it was more at uni that I had problems accessing one. Okay, um, but in, in reference to your work, because it looks, it looks as if it's risograph printed in many ways, but I think you have mentioned before that you have kind of figured out how to bootleg the riso effect. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> sort of. Um, is I it that and Kind of created stuff, that. The stuff that you've got is all is all risograph. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, I did do quite a lot of when I was in my second, and I think it was especially in my second year, I was incredibly obsessed with really, really wanted wanted to write so really, really wanted to do it. Couldn't um, couldn't really get access to one, um, and wasn't really willing to didn't know enough, so I wasn't really willing to outsource it. Because I'm mm-hmm. quite stubborn like that. Um, a lot of my practice is sort of born out of that. It's like my inability to want to go to someone else to get something printed. And um, I did do a lot of stuff um, with photocopiers. I mean, like really simple stuff, just like using bitmaps and um, printing a single color at a time. So, um, like very like grainy sort of like sugar paper and stuff to mm-hmm. produce quite as, what looks like um, riso prints. But um, that... Um, that actually is, and that, that was all in the name of doing it for cheaper. Because at the time I was sort of like, oh, right, it's so expensive, I can't be asked to do that. Um, yeah. So I was doing all this to, to be cheaper, but actually since graduating and since losing the wonderful privilege of having um, great big Canon photocopiers at my disposal, I've realised it's actually much cheaper to get, um, <laughs> it's cheaper to run the rice graph than it is to run right. uh, like okay. a giant office level photocopier. Like the, um, I was I did, genuinely shocked when I found out how much they cost. Would you say that <laughs> even if you didn't have a reason in the studio, though? Would I? Um, I yeah, I think so. Um, so. Sort of since graduating as well, I've been exposed to a lot more people who are working with research. So I've, mm-hmm. I've had a lot more access to it. Yeah, since graduating. So it's a lot about, I guess, knowing people as well, and. You know yeah. where to go to, and so connection think, is probably a big thing as well. I mean, yeah, I think there's there's a lot. I don't know. I think you know how accessible RISO is just sort of depends how um, the people with RISOs are, are using them. I guess. I mean, um, someone that I I think do it really well is the um, the big family press who work in South London Gallery. Yeah. Um, I think that what they they do an incredibly good job of sort of they you like using the RISO technology in the way it is. Like readily accessible mm-hmm. um, and I mean I'm sort of I, I hopefully trying to work towards that I mean um, I do a lot of work not anymore because um, there's no club nights happening but I was doing a lot of um, a lot of like flyers and um, posters for not only my own nights but mm-hmm. of lots of like quite a lot of other stuff in the local area that's going on as well that's nice. So do you, do you do things for free as well? 
um, when the opportunity comes up? Um, when you think I mean, it's relevant? I mean, I can't, I'm not, I mean, I, I can't really offer printing services for free. Um, I did a lot of stuff. I do free things with labels. Um, mm -hmm. For the sticker printing services that I run, I, um, I sort of have like a, a bank of money that I use from that I've made from selling stickers, but then yeah. goes back into being able to offer free sticker printing. Or um, I was used by I was doing it most recently was for people going to protests. That's that exactly what I was doing. Providing free stickers mm. for that, um, but the sort of the that's I can do that because of them. Um, how cheap it is to get the materials for the stickers with the rice wrap because you have to buy the materials in such high bulk mm -hmm. um, it's, it's more than the service it's going to be a larger operation to to do that. for sure i mean i don't i wasn't going to suggest that you should offer any of these <laughs> services for free <laughs> if i could <laughs> i'm sure you would but um because i just remember you i think posted something about sticker printing for the protest and I think that is a really cool thing to do. And I think Hatter Press has done something similar with the copy shop initiative. And I guess it's just amazing to have access to a tool like Reason to be able to offer such services to people going to protests. So do you think you're gonna do this type of things in the future as well? Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. And the copy shops have been running for like just over a year. So we actually also offered the same service for um, the Extinction Rebellion protests. Right. Uh, and we've done free printing for the protests in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. uh, partly because we have a studio in Hong Kong as well. So. Oh, wow. Is that recent? Um, so the sharing founder, Jackson, he moved to Hong Kong a couple of years ago. Wow. So they decided okay. to run Hato across both. <laughs> Spaces, but uh, yeah, copy shops is definitely something we're really passionate about and believe in. Um, I think essentially we really like using the work, sh the press, uh, in historically traditional format in the sense of being mm -hmm. used by um, protest groups, and yeah, and that's why we think it's so important to see it in that way. Mm -hmm. So, is copy shop always offering? the services for free? Uh, yeah, it was slightly different for the Black Lives Matter movement just because of the limitation of coronavirus. In the past, yeah. we offered the space up, up to actually drop in and artwork your own posts as well in the press. So you could also have access to paper and scissors and glue and um, mm -hmm. art making tools. Uh, whereas the Black Lives Matter, we had more uh, obviously digital prints being sent over but that was quite an interesting experience I found because we were sent a lot of artwork that wasn't necessarily uh, prepared for riso printing. Right. Um, and I actually felt really positive about that because it meant that we taught a lot of people in a very quick wet space mm -hmm. about the printing process. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't a case of trying to explain it and then something off or it being too expensive. It was just such, it was a one off moment where we could just very quickly have that exchange and push mm -hmm. the Rezo network out a little bit further. So I th that had lots of positive feelings that day. Wow, that's lovely. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for explaining. Um, I'm just aware of time. I would like to just remind everybody in the audience that you can ask questions and just pop them in the chat box. And while you type these up, I would just like to ask you guys one last question, which is, um, how do you think the future of Risa looks? If you consider the past and the present from where it's come from being a commercial printer, then going into the arts, where do you think the process is heading? Um, I, I personally think, I feel like it's moving more towards um, I, I think has more potential as something for sort of workshopping, experimenting. To, um, I, I think it kind of had a, uh, yeah, it had, had a sort of big stint as being like the go-to way for getting your really nice um, art prints done. And I think it is still really good for that. But I think my experience of using it 
and watching how other people use it, I think it's most exciting um, when it's used sort of more in, not necessarily like a teaching context, context but uh, like, yeah, a more kind of experimental uh, workshopping context where you're kind of getting people in who might, might not necessarily be familiar with it or not necessarily um, be sort of professional artists. Um, I think that, that seems to be how it's being used most exciting. Um, mm -hmm. I hope, hopefully that's where it's going to go in the future as well. That I'm sort of definitely trying to work out how I can contribute that because I have sort of, um, as you were saying, I run, I run workshops with sticker printers. I mean, that's mainly out of convenience because I can actually take them places. I currently don't have enough, there's not enough space in the studio uh, to put on workshops at the moment. And I mean, I, mm -hmm. I have to get it down the four flights of stairs if I want to take it out. You can't really take it through, so yeah. Yeah, I think that's sort of. I hope when we move studio, we might have more space, so mm -hmm. there's um, more like, opportunity like, for yeah, more that kind of choice. Amazing, thank you. Um, what about you two, Charlie? Where do you think Risa is heading? I mean, I think uh, I would agree with. Well, I think I think it's probably heading in two directions. Um, you know, I think that the introduction of the kind of A two Riso Press's sort of company Riso understands a kind of high level potential of it as a process. Mm -hmm. But actually, I think that I would agree with Tommy. I mean, I was really, um, it seems like the, the machine is a tool for communication or for spreading ideas in a much more um, direct way. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think, you know, the first time I heard of that being really effective was actually, I think, during the, Brasilia, the Brazil protests of about 2016, this of Riso printers started to accept posters on the day from people who wanted to have one quickly printed mm -hmm. uh, and used for protests. And, uh, you know, the protests of the last few months have really shown that there's such a need for analog communication but it's not analog communication that exists independently of digital communication. These two things are now uh, affecting each other. So it's almost as if there's generosity in one level of designers offering templated posters or posters you could go and change that can then be printed for free by printers and then taken outside into the streets, which are then photographed and shared and they sort of go back into the digital space to be recirculated in a different way. Um, mm. And I think that's really exciting. And I think that in a way, this idea that the machine or the technology can somehow uh, activate community or activate people or spread messages in, in a kind of constructive way is for me, a really exciting um, potential mm -hmm. for sure. Um, and, and so I think that's kind, of, that's kind of shown for me what, what that is, but I don't know if that really says that's the future because it does sound a lot like the past as well. Um, doesn't mean that it can, you know, can't always or be. It doesn't mean it's, it's not a negative thing. No, exactly. Um, mm. It's just, I think, you know, it's, it, it, you know, it was, it was reminiscent of kind of like, you go back to like the kind of May 68, I mean, we were used to screen printing in students' protest banners in Paris then. It was not that different. The difference is the way that digital technology has really enabled that process to be spread and more people sure. and to be shared more quickly. So that would be what I would say. Thank you. Um, Jeff is just reminding me that there's questions in the chat. Um, would you guys mind to stay on five, 10 more minutes to answer some of these questions? Okay. Um, so I'm just going to read. Um, <laughs> Jeff is just saying, Charlie was not the person who broke it. He's very careful. A few community centers had them around that time. Tommy is buying them. I have comics from early noughties, 90s from Birmingham Community Arts Center, Garden Funnies featuring Jim Medway. Um, don't know what he's referring to there. Um, but Jeff really likes how Charlie refers to personality of the Riso. I agree. Um, Patrick is asking, how did Tommy 
bootleg the reset effect during his time at uni. I think we've covered that um, where you said you were using some of the textured paper. We're um, using any like digital. Oh, just just a bit, just a bitmap. Um, kind of, bitmap, right? No bitmap on anything. Um, um, stick it to a printer. It makes it look like a. I mean, it's, yeah, it's just similar. I don't know. I I don't know how successful I was in bootlegging. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know there's like ways. There's like brushes that you can download now onto Photoshop. Draw in like a way that just emulates kind of the reset effect. Mm -hmm. It seems to be coming up and coming more and more. Yeah. Something to look into. Um, then Jeff has another question. Um, what is the address of the Hong Kong Hato? And Selene is asking if there is space for, is it, if there's a workshop space, because I think Celine is now back in Hong Kong, so. Um, possible. Yeah. Um, so Hato Press doesn't, uh, we don't have a Hato Press equivalent in Hong Kong, just okay. have a studio. Um, I'm not sure of the exact address, but it's on our website if you want to get in touch. Um, but we uh, are rolling out a workshop own kit in the oh. next few weeks whereby you can buy a kit um, and we talk through the some of the methods we use for artwork. Um, on pieces of paper, um, mm -hmm. you send those bits of paper back in and we'll print it for you and return it. So we have oh, yeah. something in place to um, fill the hole that coronavirus has left in our workshop. That's amazing. Is that international? Do you hope the only thing that might change is the payment cost of the return of the right. work? Um, mm. But we're currently looking into not limiting just have to bear in mind mm -hmm. the prepaid envelope in the package might not cover where you are. So people who live in Hong Kong or in area in general, would they send it to the Hong Kong office or does it all go back to London? Or back to London to the right. press. That's where we have the printers, yeah. Okay. Um, could you also just give me the link of that riser glitches thing? Mm. As I said, I'll post that into the group chat. Sure. And while we do that, Pat has another question. Um, has the aesthetic of Riso had an effect on the graphic design aesthetic at work form? Has the Riso... I'll do that again. Oh, sorry. That's, that's a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, someone else, maybe someone else could answer that question. That's probably better than me. Um, I mean, I Thank guess, you. like, I, I guess I hope not. Uh, well, no, actually, no, sorry. I, I don't, that's a really flippant answer. Um, a serious answer to that question would probably be what, what is a graphic design aesthetic? Um, and right. is that something that is, uh, you know, something that you go out, you sort of set out to achieve? Um, and again, you know, I, I think there was a point at which we decided that maybe we should not use the risograph for everything. Um, mm. Because I think there's a danger there of it becoming an aesthetic. Um, in some ways, what helped is that the risograph doesn't really reproduce text that well at small sizes. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, obviously, quite a lot of graphic design is typeface, so you have to kind of think about that. Um, I think, you know, I suppose it influences is sometimes how we think about things if we choose to use it for a project. Um, I think we were obviously drawn to the machine because of the bright colours uh, and those sorts of things. But that was a while ago now, and I, I think that um, the last few times we've used the risograph, I had to use it in a way that you wouldn't be able to tell it was risograph. Um, so we actually did use it for a book where we, it was just the text pages were printed on the risograph, and we tried to do it really perfectly. <laughs> um, because it was really, it was really a question of cost implications rather than um, anything else. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it's a very, it's a very good question, and you know, again, that kind of um, that balance between process and aesthetic and kind of the visual outcome, it really balances, and, and it does determine every project you do. And you know, obviously, if you're doing a project with lots of really detailed photographs, you might not use the reason for that. 
Um, and, you know, I, th I think that because the process lends itself to kind of more bold typography, big graphic shapes type things, then if you use it a lot, you might end up making work that felt like that. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I don't know, that's all no in response to that question. Um, okay, I guess yes and no. Yeah, maybe yes Correct. and no. <laughs> Um, then there's one last question from Emma saying, how was the process of buying a RISO? Um, I don't know, are you directing this at anyone in particular, Emma? Um, it's probably different for one of you. Not really. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. I think that is like, it's an interesting question because buying a RISO is not always so straightforward. It's not like you go on the Riso online market shop and just order your one. Because very, very um, seldom would you buy a Riso new. So I know that we got ours secondhand from a library up in North England, which was very lucky because we got in touch with this guy who happened to know that they sold a Riso. And then they got us, we basically bought it through like a middleman. But that was a lot of asking people, exchanging numbers, very, I guess, yeah, it wasn't very official, maybe. Um, how was it for you guys? I mean, I, I was very lucky. I came to, um, I just, I joined the studio that where the, the writer is, so um, it's very common. Yeah, but off the that makes sense. It. Um, but as for as for buying them there's a couple of um there are some useful ways there is um like interested there is a um the, the vice working group who um mm -hmm. they some help with them um and other than that i mean it, it sort of is um looking on ebay and seeing what yeah. get um a lot of time, but there's a there's there's there's, there's ways around things. Um, maybe not with the writer itself, but um, I I had a massive epiphany recently when I realised it's incredibly easy to transfer ink, um, writer ink from like the, you have a different ink cartridge for every different kind of writer ones, and um. Mm -hmm. It, yeah, I, I really haven't realised. <laughs> uh, it's a slightly embarrassing, but you can um, really, really easily transfer the inks from uh, different different ink cartridges into other ones, um, which sort of okay. makes my life a lot easier on people because um, can sort of afford to buy um, whatever's being someone's flocking for cheapest on eBay, kind of end mm -hmm. stuff type thing, and then just put it into the tubes. That's, that's good to know. That's my handy mind. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> and um, I guess since Anya, you work at an actual sophisticated institution that works with Risa, do you guys buy from the Risa company themselves? Mm, yeah, we've got um, quite a few printers now. We've got two MZs and two, um, uh, three MMs. Mm -hmm. um, and the MZs were new this year. Well, not the MF. I always get a bit muddled up. Um, but we did get two new ones this year and we do get from the comp from Riso, yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so I think that's all the questions. Um, and thank you for staying on a little bit longer to answer these. I would just again like to say thank you for joining us today, everybody. You, Charlie, Tommy, and Anya. And also thank you again to Cara and Pat for organizing this. And everyone who's listening right now, please check out our online degree show, which is live now. Um, the link will be on Facebook and on Camberwell Illustrator's Instagram. Um, yeah, and that's it for me. Thank you and see you guys soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, congratulations as well. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Congrats on the Thank you. <laughs>